Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Bob Bennis. Good morning to all of you here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. We want to thank you for joining us this morning. Our conversation continues as we launch another year's edition of Living Our Faith as we talk to people who, like us, make up our Catholic faith. Today we want to talk about the upcoming March for Life, which is going to take place later on this month uh, out in Washington. And our guest today is the Theology Department Chair down at St. Joseph Catholic Academy in Kenosha, We'll meet her in just a moment. But first, I, I, I haven't seen you since last year, Archbishop. It's Boy, a year has gone <laughs> by. I can't, uh, can't hardly believe that. Bob. The host of our show, Archbishop Jerome Lestecki. And uh, may, may I wish you a happy new year. Well, thanks very much, Bob. And the uh, same to you and uh, to all of our listeners. Mm-hmm. You know, hope they're now enjoying the new year and enjoying uh, basically the, uh, the great aspect of, uh, of God's presence in their life. And, and hope they'll continue to, to follow us and listen to us on Relevant Radio. Why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest today? Well, we're fortunate to have uh, Maria Pitt Payne with mm-hmm. us, who is the uh, chair of the theology department at uh, St. Joseph's Academy in Kenosha. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank and you. it's great, great having you. Now, t- tell us a little bit about your faith story and your faith faith journey. I, I know it's an interesting one because it involves a um, someone that I can hold dear you know, myself, St. John Paul too, you know. That's so. certainly true. Yeah, I'm actually the child of immigrants. Uh, my parents immigrated from Scotland, and uh, they came over here in, in part because of religious freedom in the United States, and uh, how important that was to them. So they they immigrated to Southern California, where I was born and grew up, and put me in Catholic schools there. So. You know, my home parish was St. John the Baptist, so I'll give them a shout out in Costa Mesa. And then uh, I went to Modern Day High School. And it was while I was there that St. John Paul II came to Los Angeles on his pastoral visit in 1987. And he happened to be celebrating Mass at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Wow. Now, it was on that visit um, that it it changed my life. Um, I was listening to him speak. He gave a youth address. Um, I think it was maybe the afternoon before that mass and I was listening to it and he said, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the life, your way, your truth and your life. And even to this day, um, I get get goosebumps goosebumps. when I say it because it was the first time that the gospel message penetrated my heart with a degree of um, clarity uh, that I just thought, oh, this is this is it. He's he's my life, and so it it uh, from that moment on, you know, I I started attending mass as often as I could, and and you know, really started to take my faith more seriously. And it would, how did that lead you into kind of the studies in theology, though? Mm-hmm. I mean, I can understand how it led you to a deeper relationship to to faith, mm-hmm. but but all, all of a sudden, suddenly now. Um, Literally a profession in in terms of directing people and right, theological yeah. thinking. Well, I think a few things happened along the way. Um, I was blessed with with great priests in my life uh, who I admired. Um, the the Norbertine fathers were out there in Orange County, and one and some of them were stationed at my high school. Uh, one of whom was Father Robert Hodges. And uh, I was on the debate team at school, and he came to us and he said, uh, "Hey, would any of you like to take part in this?" speech competition. And I said, sure, I'll have a look at it. So I, I looked at the details and it said it was sponsored by the California Pro-Life Council. And and I didn't know anything about those issues at all. I mean, I think back, you know, 30 or so years ago, it, it wasn't discussed as much. So I said, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. And the more that I researched, the more I thought, wow, you know, what the church has to say on these matters is so vital, so important. And I went on and I participated in the competition and I got to the final. So I got to go to this big uh, celebration at Disneyland Hotel and uh, they had a whole expo of all these different organizations. And when I saw, you know, that these people were putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak, they had pregnancy centers they were running. They had all these beautiful ministries that they were conducting. I thought, wow, this this is something that I think I could be a part of. And it stuck with me. And so um, I pursued those studies, both, you know, bachelor's and, and ultimately at the master's level. And uh, I love reaching students at that high school age because that's where I got impacted. And I feel like sharing my story with them, you know, um, can impact them, too. 
we're, we're talking about you though going from um, uh, from California, Costa Mesa, California, yes, to cold, cold Wisconsin. It now, is cold. Now, <laughs> <laughs> cold now, month did, of the year. Sure. As how did that, now, how did that happen, Marie? Well, in part, it's because I have six children. Um, when we moved, though, we only had four, um, but really. We were out there in Southern California. My husband was working so hard uh, that I hardly saw him. And we thought, you know, we we had such an emphasis on trying to live a family life. We thought, where can we do this without me feeling like a single parent all the time? Because he had to work so hard because of the cost of living out there. So we said, hey, let's go to the Midwest. Um, and so we moved initially to, to Illinois back in 2000, um, ended up having two more kids once we came out here. Um, but it was really to try to have a better family life that we wanted to come to the Midwest. Now your, your, I should say, shouldn't say avocation, but, um, vocation as a, um, um, as a, uh, a teacher in theology mm-hmm. and, and in the grounding in, in, in pro-life, how did, those two mm-hmm. things come blend together. Well, I think part of it was um, when we did come out to uh, the Midwest and I got involved in the parish, my pastor invited me to do some confirmation prep and teaching some some classes in our parish faith formation programs. Um, he also saw that I had uh, some knowledge in those areas. And so um, my husband and I, you know, my husband especially would do marriage prep weekends and things like that. And and, and those things fit really nicely together. And ultimately, it was my pastor who said he thought I would be a good teacher, which is which is why I went on to do that. But um, I think part of it is just the tapestry that is the Catholic faith is so interconnected. And I found that um, the moral elements of the Catholic faith were just as beautiful as the mysteries that we you know celebrate in terms of doctrine. That it to me, it was just a tapestry. It was the same thing. So... Now we are talking about um, uh, a pro-life, and mm-hmm. obviously the importance of Mark. How do you how do you frame uh, basically the argument and the presentation of the support for pro-life for for your students? You know that's a great question. <laughs> um, my very first. Uh, class that I taught to seniors at St. Joseph Catholic Academy was a vocations class. And of course, when you're teaching vocations, you're going to hit all the quote unquote hot button issues because you're going to talk about marriage. You're going to talk about sexuality. You're going to talk about priesthood, all these elements. So the very first day I walked into class and I had a young lady in the very front row and she said, just promise me you're not going to say anything about all this moral stuff. I've heard it my whole life. <laughs> I don't want to hear it again. I'm almost graduated. Just please promise me you're not going to talk about that stuff. And I said, well, of course I'm going to talk about that stuff. <laughs> Sorry That's to my job. You. <laughs> Sorry. I said, but I do promise you that I'll listen to every question that you have. I'll treat your questions with respect. I'll try to answer them as best as I possibly can. But you've got to promise me one thing. That every time you see a no in church teaching, that you believe, because I'm going to tell you that it's true, that there's a much bigger yes in church teaching. So if you hear no to one thing, it's because there's a way bigger yes. And I'm going to teach you what the yeses are, and then you're going to see how this all fits together. So, you you know, well, <laughs> at the end of my class, I always do a survey. I say, what did you like? What mm-hmm. did you not like? You know, how can I do this better? So she wrote me a note uh, at the end of class on her survey. And she said, I just want to tell you that for the first time in years, I'm not angry at the church. Wow. And because I really have come to see that the church's stance on life issues is a really big yes. And for me, that makes everything, everything. yeah, mm-hmm. everything worthwhile. Everything. So, How yeah. old are the students that you teach? Um, well, I teach seniors and I also teach freshmen. So I get them at the start of the high school season of like 14 and 15, and then I get 17, 18. So, wow. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I go back to what you said about there's going to be some no's, but there's much greater, much bigger yeses. Yes. And as a parent, and there are parents who are listening, mm-hmm. uh, these are things we have to talk about with our kids. Give us a, 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 a quick example of, of a, a no and then a yes. Can, mm-hmm. can you do that? Sure. Or should we hold that until after the break? I think, I think we'll hold that 
until after the break okay. so that we're not, not rushed for time. Okay. We're going to go into break, and we're going to remind our, uh, our listeners that this show repeats on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 930. We've got the news coming up from our friends at the Catholic Herald. You're listening to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. This is Bob Bennis of Relevant Radio, and I want to tell you about a Catholic-owned, Catholic-proud car dealership. That dealership is Uptown Motors. My wife loves her 2015 Ford Fusion, and a fellow parishioner loves his 2015 Ford Fusion. Our parish, St. Agnes and Butler, loves the donations they receive from Uptown Motors. Here's Uptown Sales Manager Jeff Sardina. Our faith teaches us to give back to our community and to others. At Uptown Motors, we've always believed in this. Stop in at one of our three dealerships and purchase a new or used car, and we'll donate $200 to the parish of your choice. This is not a sales promotion or a limited-time offer. This is who we are. Visit Uptown Ford Lincoln on Mayfair Road in Milwaukee or Uptown Chevy Dodge Chrysler Jeep on Highway 60 in Slinger, and remember to say you heard this ad on Relevant Radio. Uptown Motors, a family business from generation to generation, Catholic-owned and Catholic-proud. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Grace David with the top stories from the Catholic Herald and CatholicHerald.org. Pope Francis had an important message for families on the Feast of the Holy Family. Open your doors to God and His love, or your family will harbor an individualism that endangers peace and joy. Recognizing and encouraging the importance of strong and united families is especially needed today when the family is subjected to misunderstanding and difficulties of various kinds, which weaken it he said on December 27th. The true joy that's experienced in the family isn't something random or accidental. It is a joy that is the result of the deep harmony between people who savor the beauty of being together, of supporting each other on life's journey, he said. Earlier that day, the Pope celebrated a special Mass in St. Peter's Basilica dedicated to families. The Pope suggested mothers and fathers bless their children at the start and end of each day, by making the sign of the cross on their children's foreheads like they did at their baptism. Six days earlier, Pope Francis had another family-related message, this one for Vatican employees. He told them to take care of your marriage and aging parents, play with your kids, and always make peace at the end of the day. The most important thing he wanted to tell them, he said, is to take care of their marriage and never take it for granted. The Pope also said to make sure the children get to live or spend time with their grandparents. If you've made New Year's resolutions and are concerned about whether or not you'll be able to keep them, Catholic News Service columnist Bill Dodds has a suggestion. Try the 10% approach. That approach, he learned, says never increase an activity by more than 10% a week. That small addition is the safest and surest way to keep heading toward a goal without getting discouraged and giving up. Let's say that in 2016, you want to set aside time every day for reading the Bible and private prayer. Begin with one minute, 60 seconds per day, for the first week. Then, using the 10% rule, bump it up to 66 seconds the next week, and so on. Over time, you'll be reading scripture and praying an hour a day. The numbers don't lie. Whether they refer to time or distance, if you begin an exercise program, walking only one-tenth of a mile a day three days a week, or praying, if you make the effort to increase beneficial activities, Ultimately, they can eclipse the bad ones, and this will help you on a healthy and prosperous 2016. And you can keep up to date on all that is happening in 2016 in the Catholic Herald by visiting catholicherald.org. This is Grace David. Thank you for listening. We now return you to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. Our guest today is Marie Pitt Payne. She is the Theology Department Chair down at St. Joseph Catholic Academy in Kenosha. And before the break, we were talking about dealing with younger people. And as we talk about the march and talk more about the march, we're going to talk about uh, how that impacts young people today. But we talked about for every no you hear back when you were teaching, yeah. um, there's a much greater yes. yes. Can you give us an example? Well, I'm going to start by telling you about a poster that I have on my wall sure. in my classroom. And it's actually a quote from Pope Benedict XVI. Mm -hmm. And it has his picture there, and it says, Each of us is willed, each of us is loved, and each of us is necessary. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes, and I always point it out to my students at the beginning of the year because I think uh, one of the things that 
teens encounter today is they don't always feel wanted or necessary or loved. And when I spell out the fact that the church is teaching, for example, on something like abortion or euthanasia or any of these um, issues where sometimes, um, you know, sentiment can take us in one direction, um, I try to show them that the church is presenting a view in which every single human life is loved and wanted and necessary. And so whether that is one of the 90 plus percent children with Down syndrome, who unfortunately today Mm -hmm. in this country, um, we will lose as a consequence of, um, you know, the the prenatal diagnosis. Um, Or it can be, you know, the person with Alzheimer's at the end of their life. We're called to love each one of them. It's a huge yes to all human persons. And the further um, our culture goes into materialism, Mm -hmm. which I think is one of the the big uh, factors in this, where they don't necessarily feel created by a loving God anymore. You know, we need to remind them of this fact. And so at that point, the yes becomes a movement towards, you know, reaching out to every human person. I think that that would be one example Mm -hmm. of it. Now, Marie, you're going to be uh, uh, generating a, uh, a group of young people to accompany you to Washington, D.C. for the march. Yes. You know, um, and um, what do you do to, to to prepare them, to get them ready for it? And, and what do you see in terms of their response mm-hmm. to uh, the March for Life? Well, right now, our response has been overwhelming. In fact, we have a waiting list. Um, and this is the second year in a row that we've had a, a, a very... Uh, I would say very enthusiastic response to. Can you put numbers on that? Um, right now, we have fifty students mm-hmm. and six chaperones because the bus maxes out at fifty six. Sure. Um, I was instructed by our finance director that if we have a waiting list for a third year, then God willing, we can add a second bus. What do we do to prepare them? We talk about it on on different levels. We talk about theologically the issues that we've been talking about regarding respect for all life. We talk about it as an issue of love, but we also talk about it as a civic responsibility as well, because Mm -hmm. um, in fact, one of the things we did last year, um, we visited the monuments and in looking at some of the words, for example, of the declaration of independence etched up in these huge monuments. And you say, you know, you are part of a civic tradition in the United States of America, uh, a proud civic tradition of, of standing up for those who, can't defend themselves, you know, the the civil rights aspect of the march, um, we also talk to the students about. So I think there are many levels um, that we're able to convey to them, which get them excited about it. And now talking about the experience of those, and since you attended March for last year, Mm -hmm. what was what was your experience? What did you take away from the uh, the March for Life? I think the takeaway, um, certainly this has been expressed by the students to me, but I I grasp this myself, is the scale of the uh, number of people who are there for the sake of the unborn and their moms and their dads and their families and the whole community. Mm -hmm. Because this isn't just about babies in the womb. This is about the entire community that would benefit from having these people around. So when you get there and there are, say, 500 to 600,000 people there with you, you don't feel isolated anymore. You realize this this is a genuine movement. This is not something strange or you know freakish or maybe a little bit odd. You know, you get out there and it's like, this is very mainstream and filled with young people. That's the thing I think that sometimes surprises them. It's like they're excited, they're enthusiastic, they have this drive to do good in the world, and it pumps them up like like nothing I've seen um, in terms of a desire to to you know, live their lives for the sake of these truths. And you use the word mainstream, which didn't go beyond my ears. Mm-hmm. It's a very mainstream movement nowadays, but unfortunately, it's it's not covered it's not by, by our mainstream, mainstream media. media. Right, Correct. exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the, the, the really, I, I guess if there's a, a, a disappointment, mm-hmm. is the, the fact that if you bring 500 to 600,000 people into mm-hmm. any area, bring 500,000 into the city of Milwaukee, mm-hmm. how could the how could the newspapers and the, and, and the radio fail to cover 
the, this significant event, and yet they do. They, they do. They do. Yeah. Yet they do. Yes. You know, um, I agree with you. I I think this is a this is really a movement that those who are in the the legislature should pay attention to because mm-hmm. it's a movement of the young, mm-hmm. um, and that's the future. Yeah. You're talking about literally a shift. In the attitude towards life. I think that's right. And um, certainly as part of the St. John Paul II generation, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe his most famous biography was called Witness to Hope. Um, I really feel like when you go to the march, it's this incredibly powerful witness to hope. And you probably have seen a difference from when you first started uh, where you are to where we are today with technology. And, yes. and not only do you have the power of people and the witness of people together, but you also have the, the support of the technology, which back in the day we didn't have to mm-hmm. the extent that we have it today. We're, we will be going to the March for Life Expo. We get to stay mm-hmm. in the hotel there, the Renaissance sure. that, the, um, that the actual conference is going to be at. And, you know, they all have their little spots where you can tweet from and send it out to all your friends. And, you know, they're all running their Facebook messages. Mm-hmm. And um, the kids absolutely love that. Heck, I love that. I mean, <laughs> you know, the fact that we can, you know, it doesn't matter what the mainstream media does. Right. What we can do is we have our own media through social media. So get on your Twitter, get on your Instagrams, get on your Facebook, share with your community what's going on. And, and you know, other people are enthused to join as well. And what you're doing through this movement, through this march, through your work, is you're better preparing these young people to have the discussion and the debate out in the world mm-hmm. with other people. Mm-hmm. Whereas at a time, it was something, we go back to, to a different time period, but it was something that I'm pro-life, but I don't, I don't talk about it. I'm not, I, I can't talk about it. I, I don't know what necessarily to say other than mm-hmm. I'm pro-life. Um, now you've got so many more resources. Yeah, I people think, are better equipped. The I think we should be equipped. proud to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that impressed me so much was the fact that there are so many people who want to help others and want to help women who find themselves, unfortunately, in a crisis pregnancy. Mm -hmm. We want to help them. Mm -hmm. Um, How can we make it possible for you to welcome the life that you so so badly want to welcome, but feel like you can't because of the pressures, because of things that are, you know, conspiring against you in your circumstance. How can we make it possible for you to do what your heart tells you that you want to do? And and that's um, the hope that's provided through crisis pregnancy centers. I rem- I've visited down at the Women's Center in Chicago and seen the wonderful things that they do. Um, there's so many life centers throughout the country and people who really, really do want to help. Are, are young people, when they uh, come back from, say, um, the March uh, for Life, mm-hmm. I, um, if you know, do you notice a change in them? Do you notice uh, that they, they want to be actively involved in, um, uh, in whatever way, shape, or form yes. supporting life causes? Yes. There's a change in them both um, on that more kind of global level in terms of being involved in causes, but there's also been some pretty nitty gritty changes. There was one young man who came back from the march and said, I will never behave the way that I used to behave with my girlfriend because I've been on the March for Life. He realized his responsibility as a young man, um, what it meant to be pro-life and that he had to be chased, basically. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I see as a um, uh, as a moral theologian is the fact that I often uh, times uh, object to the the separation of pro life from social justice. Mm-hmm. You you can't have social justice without pro life. Correct. They're they're intrinsically tied. You yes. can't talk about feeding the poor, clothing the naked, doing everything that we talk about in the uh, in the year of mercy unless. You have life first. Correct. I you know, agree. Yeah. Life, life, life is is there to be cherished, protected, and nourished, so that all the rest of the uh, the the bounties of God's uh, benefits can be extended to that mm-hmm. to that person. Uh, do, do you see in some of your students making that connection, in pro life and social justice? Yeah, I think we do. Um, And I would say it even goes back further. Um, We have the social justice connection. And in fact, in the junior year, um, the course that we work with the the students on is social social justice. And we take a number of saints 
you know, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Blessed Damien of Molokai. He's a saint now, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, and and what they did for you know various underserved populations. Well, the unborn right now are an underserved population as far as we're concerned, and so we definitely see that connection. Um, and anything that they would do on behalf of the unborn would be considered service hours, you know, that go towards their their service component um, of participating in our theology program. But um, even I would even connect it to their own moral behaviors as well. Um, you know, when you start taking um, procreation seriously, mm -hmm. then you have to look at other behaviors as well. Um, and the whole uh, gamut of the church's teachings on sexuality um, become far more relevant when uh, you really realize that sex produces children. <laughs> and, and, you know, our culture has very much tried to separate the two, yeah, right. but they're not separable. <laughs> and so um, then all of a sudden questions about pornography, questions about, you know, natural family planning, questions about all these various uh, topics come up and they start to see the wisdom and the coherence of the church's teaching, which makes them better Catholics. And it, it, it forces them to think about the commodities that are being used in, uh, in, in a modern society, mm -hmm. embracing pornography yeah. and yet talking in, with the same model of the dignity of women. Correct. How, how do you how, how do you merge those those two things together? It yeah. forces you to, to understand, in your words, the larger yes, yes that the church is 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 telling you to embrace. That's precisely it. And 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 the reason I were, use the word quote unquote better Catholics is because when when you can really wholeheartedly say, wow, this teaching is coherent and it's based in reality, um, then you're able to witness more powerfully from the heart than, oh, well, that's the party line. You know, so you're able to to be um, a more prophetic witness when you really see the interconnectedness of all of those things. Marie Pitt Payne, we thank you very, very much for joining us today. We wish you all the best at the March for Life. The date on that, again, is January 22nd. The uh, National Prayer Vigil for Life will take place the night before on the 21st. We're going to take our final break. Thank you to the listeners for joining us here on Relevant Radio. This is Bob Bennis of Relevant Radio, and I want to tell you about a Catholic-owned, Catholic-proud car dealership. That dealership is Uptown Motors. My wife loves her 2015 Ford Fusion, and a fellow parishioner loves his 2015 Ford Fusion. Our parish, St. Agnes and Butler, loves the donations they receive from Uptown Motors. Here's Uptown Sales Manager Jeff Sardina. Our faith teaches us to give back to our community and to others. At Uptown Motors, we've always believed in this. Stop in at one of our three dealerships and purchase a new or used car and we'll donate $200 to the parish of your choice. This is not a sales promotion or a limited time offer. This is who we are. Visit Uptown Ford Lincoln on Mayfair Road in Milwaukee or Uptown Chevy Dodge Chrysler Jeep on Highway 60 in Slinger. And remember to say you heard this ad on Relevant Radio. Uptown Motors, a family business from generation to generation. Catholic owned and Catholic proud. We'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And as we always do when we end the show, we kick off the new year with a closing prayer. And let us um, dedicate this closing prayer for all of those who are in the pro-life movement, helping us to understand the value and the dignity that's inherent in every life and that God's image is there upon each and every one of us. And we do so through the role of mother. And we have one common mother who joins us all together. So we pray to her in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women and, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Patroness of Pro-Life, pray, pray for, for us. us. And may God's blessings be upon all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. And remember to see with God's eyes. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.